Okay. Sorry. Okay, should I go ahead, Monsi? Yes, please. Okay. All right. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, we're very honored today to have Risa Wexler as our annual uh, Bard lecturer on visitor. The you know, circumstances of COVID being what they are, uh, we had invited Risa a year ago and you know, in, with what in hindsight was very foolish optimism, delayed to the fall and then delayed again. And Risa has very generously agreed to, to give the lecture and uh, we hope that, that when it's safe and uh, uh, things are back a little more to normal, uh, we'll be able to follow up with uh, uh, a visit uh, from Risa since I'm sure there's you know, uh, many of us who'd love the chance to, to talk with her more and hopefully there'll be opportunities for that. Um, uh, so I'll introduce her in just a moment. I just wanted to, to say for people in the department who might not know, this lecture series uh, is made possible by an endowment from the Bard family, uh, from uh, Captain Forrest Bard and his sister Aubrey Trigg in honor of uh, uh, R. Jack and Forrest Lynn Bard, their parents. And I'm just going to say a couple words at the request of the family to, to uh, uh, honor their you know, donation, making this visitor series possible. Uh, uh, in particular, Captain Bard was uh, born and uh, lived in Texas in 1912 to 2009 uh, and served in the Navy for much of his life. Uh, a few highlights here. Uh, there's a lot of different uh, uh, text I know on this, but uh, uh, he served during World War II uh, and uh, was largely involved in naval intelligence. Uh, uh, working in the Pacific theater, uh, decoding Japanese naval codes, uh, worked in code breaking unit and a code breaking unit at Pearl Harbor uh, and broke codes that enabled uh, uh, sinking of Japanese aircraft carriers, work that was classified until actually uh, uh, much later on, um, was also uh, an intelligence officer uh, in the Battle of Coral Sea. Um, and then uh, in 1944 uh, was dispatched to Australia to decrypt uh, Japanese army code books um, and to, to use those in the uh, theater in the Philippines uh, uh, throughout the, the, towards the end of the war. Um, but then after uh, his career in the Navy, he became a uh, physics professor at Long Beach College uh, and I thought the most interesting part uh, with obvious bias of recent events was his work on developing a course to be filmed and shown on public television, uh, sort of you know, early versions of, of remote learning. And uh, uh, you know, it's worth remembering that this isn't the first time we've, we've all had to relearn how to do this. This picture is not directly from uh, his career, but uh, from students learning remotely over radio courses during a 1937 uh, polio epidemic. So, uh, you know, this is uh, uh, something we've we've reinvented, I guess, in the past. Um, uh, but then later took a sabbatical at, at Caltech and uh, audited a number of physics and astronomy courses, had a number of discussions with uh, various members of the, the physics and astronomy faculty here. Uh, that uh, led him uh, and his sister ultimately to, to uh, endow this uh, visitor program uh, in memory of their parents. So um, uh, with that said, I'll cease sharing and uh, let Risa uh, set up while I uh, briefly introduce her. Um, uh, uh, so uh, as I said, we're honored to have Risa Wexler today as our speaker. Uh, Reese is a professor in physics at Stanford and the Department of Particle Physics and Astrophysics at SLAC. She's the director of the Kavli Institute for Particle Physics and Cosmology, or KIPAC, and uh, she's currently a, uh, uh, an, 
Gregory Amidon University Fellow, which is an honor uh, for her work in education, undergraduate education, I believe. Uh, um, and she's uh, done a tremendous amount of, of uh, you know, incredible work. Uh, she's co-chaired and led multiple working groups in DES and advisory committees for things like LSST and Laura Labs and uh, many honors. She's a fellow of the American Physical Society, former Hubble Fellow and KICP Fellow uh, uh, before she joined Stanford uh, after completing her PhD at uh, Santa Cruz on uh, dark matter, uh, and really a pioneer in connecting astrophysical observables to the, to the dark side of the universe. Um, those of you who have been taking my uh, galaxies class that, that we had the last lecture of today have seen about 20 plots from different work of Risa's, including things that we now take for granted, like abundance matching and uh, everything that we kept calling the halo model. Risa really pioneered a tremendous amount of that uh, uh, work and uh, really just a major leader in the sort of theory, not just the theory, but also the design of searches and really how we go out there and observationally try to trace dark matter uh, with a variety of tools. And I, I think we'll hear more about that in her talk. So thank you, Risa. Uh, take it away. Thank you, Phil. And uh, thank you, Nancy. And, and thank you, everyone, for inviting me to Caltech. And I'm really sorry that I can't be there in person. Um, I know we're all tired of staring at each other in, in little boxes. Um, but I hope uh, we can at least uh, share a little bit of the joy of some fun science um, this afternoon. So um, as, as Phil mentioned, I, I have spent a large fraction of my career kind of working on the connection between the dark side of the universe um, that we can model in computers, as you see on the left side of my title slide, and the part of the universe that we can actually go out and observe. And you can see one example of that on, on the right side of my screen or, or in the background, um, because today I'm not gonna talk about all galaxies. I'm gonna talk mostly about the smallest galaxies in the universe and what we can, how we can use those tiny galaxies to learn about the dark side of the universe. Um, I'm gonna talk about the work of a large number of people today, um, but I wanna especially highlight the work of Ethan Nadler, who is my graduate student finishing this um, spring, and he'll actually be moving to your neighborhood uh, in, in the fall uh, as a Carnegie Fellow, and also the work of Yao Yuan Mao, uh, my former student and now a Hubble Fellow at Rutgers. Um, and I'll also be talking about work from the Dark Energy Survey Collaboration, specifically, uh, mo mostly about the work from the Milky Way Working Group uh, and the Saga Collaboration, which is a really fun, very small collaboration that I've been uh, uh, working on with Marla Jiha. So um, I usually uh, start my uh, talks with this very, very simple pie chart that describes essentially the standard cosmological model that we have now in the in the 20 early 2020s, um, where you know, only 5% of the universe is made up of the same stuff that, that we are. Most of the matter in the universe is, is some sort of dark matter. We're trying to figure out what it is. And uh, most of the total energy density is not matter at all. It's made out of dark energy, uh, which, um, which changes the expansion history and how structure grows in the universe. Now we call this, this model lambda CDM, the lambda for the, the dark energy part or cosmological constant and uh, the CDM for cold dark matter. And I'm gonna be focusing actually mostly on the dark matter piece of this pie today. Um, in, in, my, in my work, I, I do a lot with the dark energy side as well. And I decided to focus today. So I'm not gonna talk about that. You'll have to have me back to hear more about dark energy. But I'm gonna be talking about how we learn about dark matter from this uh, 5%. So I wanna start by saying that, you know, this model, um, which has, you know, something like seven parameters to describe, you know, these, these pieces and, and how they're structured, makes really detailed predictions. And that's a lot of what I do, do in my group. Let's see if this will actually play. There we go. Um, 
this model makes predictions based on the cosmological parameters and maybe the movie which was playing a minute ago will not play what you should be seeing if this was working correctly is that uh, these two sides of the screen should be evolving differently the basic idea is that we can do simulations of the universe which evolve differently based on their cosmological parameters and that allows us to make very precise predictions essentially based on this pie chart and how and the other parameters that go into it um so now I want to talk a little bit about the dark matter piece, and, and you'll see if you were paying really close attention that I added a word here, uh, the cold dark matter. And I want to talk really about what do we mean by cold and what do we actually know about dark matter and, and its coldness or lack of coldness. So what do we mean by CDM? When we talk about cold dark matter uh, today, we are normally talking about um, what's called a cold or slowly moving, long-lived thermal particle. And dark matter particles are typically characterized by a free streaming length, how far they, they can travel. Um, and on scales smaller than that, density fluctuations are erased and clustering is suppressed. And I'll say more about that in my talk. But in the context of structure formation, by CDM, we usually mean a model which consists of a particle for which that free streaming length is small enough that it doesn't impact structure formation at all. If it didn't impact it at all, it would be essentially perfectly cold. And we also usually mean a model in which its interactions, for example, the interactions of dark matter with itself or the interactions of dark matter particles with standard model particles don't impact structure formation. Now, just as a note, most real CDM models break these assumptions in some regime, but it may be in a re regime that's so far away uh, from observable that, that you could never uh, see that. Okay, so this, as I said, this model makes a lot of predictions. Um, it makes predictions for the number of dark matter halos. It makes predictions for their clustering. It makes predictions for um, features in the dark matter power spectrum, uh, like, like features uh, here in the, in the galaxy clustering that you can observe, particularly at high redshift. Um, it makes predictions for what we call hierarchical merging, that things start very small and grow over time. And it makes predictions for lots of substructure and the consequences of that substructure. So that includes uh, substructures within substructures, you know, within a dark matter halo, you'll have a, a halo coming in that also has a lot of its sub substructures itself. It makes predictions that those substructures should be destroyed and you should then see the remnants of those destroyed substructures. And it makes predictions for the internal structure of dark matter halos that they are really cuspy. So these predictions are, we, we've been making these predictions now for um, almost 40 years. Uh, in, in the context of CDM. And so these predictions and, uh, are, are now quite robust and in many, many cases, very well tested with the distribution of, of galaxies and their properties. But they are much less well tested on small scales. So this is about the predictions of CDM, but what, what is dark matter? Well, we don't really know. And for a long time in, in astronomy, we've kind of gone forward with this idea that it's probably just the simplest thing, a weakly interacting massive particle, or something that behaves just like it for the purposes of structure formation. But I think over the last 10 years or so, as we have so far failed to see any evidence of this WIMP, um, the, the dark matter landscape has really kind of blossomed in terms of the kinds of things that particle physicists are now talking about as possible dark matter models. And um, I just want to give some examples um, because many alternatives to CDM actually suppress power on small scales or they have impacts in dense regions. And some examples of those kinds of models are warm dark matter, fuzzy dark matter, ultralight dark matter, self-interacting dark matter, sterile neutrinos. And I want to emphasize that I don't think there is yet any clear evidence that uh, the model is different from CDM, 
but these are but some of these are perfectly reasonable models and we should look for them look for evidence of them and try to see uh, if we can find evidence for them or rule them out so if we um, think about sort of one of the most standard predictions of our cosmological model, the dark matter power spectrum, you can see this uh, beautiful plot here, uh, which is you know, the result of decades of work from multiple cosmology collaborations that plot that shows the power spectrum as a function of wave number with large scales on the left-hand side and small scales on the right-hand side. And you can see that this is the prediction of a lambda CDM model, which is now very, very well measured from a, a large number of experiments over a very wide range of scales. Now, the scales where these different models come in um, actually is, is smaller scales than you generally see on this plot. So the places where warm interacting or fuzzy kinds of dark matter might come in are on scales that are smaller than you see in this Planck uh, plot. And, and that's because, you know, if they had large impacts on larger scales, they're basically already ruled out, okay? So this is the kind of thing that still could happen is that could be many, you know, many of these alternative models do alter power on small scales and thus they would have subsequent impacts on galaxy formation. And just to show this in, in a little bit more detail, um, this is a images from a nice review article by James Bullock and, and Mike Boland Colchin showing a three time, kind, kinds of models. One model uh, on the left is, is CDM. On the right, you see a warm dark matter model, which has a fewer substructures. And in the middle, you see a self-interacting dark matter model, which has a different uh, density profile of both the main halo and the subhalos. So, um, you know, this has uh, been a really, really interesting area, but it is can be quite confusing because dark matter isn't the only thing happening on these scales. Galaxy formation also impacts the galaxy population um, and feedback can be really important, especially for small galaxies where you have a little, a little object that doesn't have um, you know, as strong a gravitational pull to hold things together, then feedback processes can be are quite disruptive, not only to the baryons themselves, but also to the dark matter. And here are just three examples. One is that uh, reionization in the, in the early universe can suppress small galaxies that aren't large enough before it starts. Um, feedback models uh, can, you know, things like supernova feedback or stellar feedback can, can blow out the gas and, and change the density profile of a halo. Um, and, uh, and, the, even in a galaxy like the Milky Way, the disk itself can change the properties and disrupt satellites that come in. And that's now a well-established um, um, result from a large number of hydrodynamical simulations. So a core piece that we need before we think about how do we use galaxies to constrain dark matter is uh, to constrain this galaxy halo connection and, um, you know, if, if, if we had dark matter eyes, we would love to be able to see this uh, image on uh, the left, which is an image that, that my group produced in, in, a, in a simulation um, of Lambda CDM. But we can't see that directly. What we can see is, uh, you know, these kinds of beautiful images of galaxies. And we have to use their properties to, to infer what this dark matter distribution looks like. Now, um, we, we have learned quite a bit about this galaxy halo connection over the years, and, and Phil mentioned one of the approaches that, that I've really pushed um, is this really simple idea, just that we think that galaxy properties are very connected to their dark matter halos. Once you get a dark matter halo of a given mass that's large enough, it starts to grow a galaxy, and the formation of that galaxy is correlated with the formation of the dark matter halo. So in the simplest version, the most massive galaxy goes in the massive, most massive halo, and you can just go on down the line to understand how to statistically connect these two populations. And that approach has worked exceedingly well um, to actually understand how galaxies and dark matter halos are connected. Um, but that is really largely at the massive end. Um, so it's this, this plot shows the fraction of mass in stars as a function of halo mass. This is from a review article we wrote a couple of years ago. 
And um, it's really pretty well understood above 10 to the 12, maybe even above 10 to the 11 solar mass halos, um, you know, above the Milky Way and, and maybe a little bit less. Uh, we understand this pretty well. And, and by understand, I mean, we have a bunch of complementary techniques that we can use to understand this and we can go out and test it with galaxy clustering, with lensing, with velocity dispersions, all of these things. But we don't have that kind of detailed information at lower masses. And the rest of uh, my talk is mostly going to be focused in this yellow regime where there's still, and, and maybe even a little bit lower mass, where there's still quite a bit of uncertainty about what's happening here. How much scatter is there between galaxy properties and halo properties? What is the halo mass where you never even get a galaxy, where you're not massive enough to form a galaxy? What is really the threshold of galaxy formation? Um, do all of the halos survive uh, baryon processes or do some of them get destroyed? So these are all really important questions um, in, in understanding this. So back to this question of how do we actually probe this small scale structure in order to learn about the properties of galaxies? Well, there's lots of, uh, sorry, about the properties of dark matter. There's lots of ways to do this. Um, the one that I'm going to be talking about today the most is actually just by counting dwarf galaxies, but both counting dwarf galaxies and looking at their internal structure are important ways. Strong lensing is an important way um, that you can use to actually identify small substructures. Um, stellar streams that are produced by the substructures and then little uh, gaps in, in streams that are caused by substructures going through uh, the streams. Um, the Lyman Alpha Forest gives a way to probe small scales in, in the early universe when it's still in the linear regime. Um, the presence of early galaxies can actually inform um, small scale structure because if you don't have a lot of small scale structure, you won't get enough galaxies in the early universe to, uh, to have reionization uh, early enough. Um, and various measurements of 21 centimeter in, in the early universe can also be a really interesting way to probe small structure, small scale structure, which I think is going to um, really blossom in the future. So, the, the, but the thing that I'm going to talk about most today is, um, is satellite galaxies. And these, this is an, an image, I just love this image so much, this recent, recent image of the Milky Way from the Gaia satellite. And one of the things that I love so much about this image um, is that you can actually see our two neighbors here, the Large Magellanic Cloud and the Small Magellanic Cloud in, in this image um, on, on the sky. Um, for those many of you, I'm sure uh, being engaged with, with uh, observing have been to the Southern Hemisphere. Um, and you, know, you can see these two galaxies in the, in the Southern Hemisphere. They were recorded by uh, many, uh, many uh, Aboriginal people in, in Australia, in South America, in Asia, uh, long before they were named by Magellan. Um, so these two galaxies are two of the galaxies uh, that orbit the Milky Way. But in the last 20 years or so, we have found a whole bunch more. And this is just one example uh, of one of the galaxies that we discovered in the Dark Energy Survey. So this is a hard thing to do to find the galaxies that are fainter than say the top 10 brightest that are in the Milky Way because they're so small and so uh, nearby that they're very, that the stars in the galaxies, which you can see in the right-hand side actually just disappear when, when they're in the whole field of other stars in the Milky Way and galaxies um, outside the Milky Way. And so this really took regular sky surveys, um, starting with the Sloan Digital Sky Survey to, to really be able to do this. And, and um, this plot is quite amazing because it shows you how much has happened in this field um, in the last, um, in the last uh, 15 years or so, um, starting, starting with Sloan, um, where a bunch of these uh, ultrafaint galaxies were discovered. And then in, in the most recent five years um, from the Dark Energy Survey and several other surveys uh, that have identified uh, these galaxies. So that we're now up to a number of close to 60 galaxies that we think orbit uh, the Milky Way. And um, the, the ones that are filled red circles actually have 
uh, had follow-up spectroscopy, typically either with Keck or Magellan, um, so that the velocities of the stars have actually been measured and we know something about their masses. So we really know that these galaxies are dark matter dominated systems. Um, and we can then learn about, uh, about what they are. So um, the work that I'm going to tell you about today is based on a new search that we did uh, quite recently, which combined um, the dark energy survey with pan stars to really do what I, I think is the first really systematic search of most of the sky. So with this search, we were actually able to uh, look at more than three quarters of the sky. Um, and you can see here that, you know, most of the sky that's not covered by the galactic plane was covered by this search. The red part of this search was observed by the Dark Energy Survey, which did 5,000 square degrees. And then uh, the rest of this uh, gray shaded region um, was done by pan stars, which is a shallower survey, but was still able to detect uh, a decent number of dwarf galaxies. So, um, with this search, it was really great because we actually uh, did an automated search with two independent algorithms and found most of the satellites. And I think more importantly than finding them, because uh, many of them had been known from previous searches, we were for the first time really able to characterize the selection function of these satellites over, again, most of the sky. And that's really important because if we want to compare that to models of the dark matter distribution, we have to know what is it that we're actually seeing? So uh, that, that work is described in, in this paper uh, by uh, Alex Derlicka Wagner, Keith Bechtel, and, uh, and the DES Milky Way Working Group that, that I was involved in. And uh, then uh, Ethan Nadler and I, uh, in collaboration with that group, uh, led the theory side of this to really try to connect the dark matter uh, simulations um, and models of the galaxy halo connection in this low mass regime uh, to, those, um, to those observations. So the basic idea is we do uh, zoom in simulations. We start with a large cosmological box and we identify systems that look like the Milky Way, uh, either by having just, just the mass of the Milky Way, or sometimes we specifically select for both the mass and the properties of the brightest satellite, the LMC, which turns out to be important. I'll tell you about in a minute. Um, and then we have a model for how the galaxies are related to the dark matter halos. So this is a, a version of an abundance matching model, but, but tuned uh, with some specifics that are quite important for the dwarf uh, satellite regime. Um, we then actually observe those simulations, really using the full selection function based on the imaging study that I just told you about, and then calculate the likelihood of, of uh, that model given the data. Um, and hopefully this movie will work. Um, this is an example of one of those simulations. Here you see the Milky Way, uh, the LMC, which is going to come in and uh, Gaia Enceladus, which is another satellite that was recently identified by the Gaia survey uh, that comes in. And let's see if this movie will work. I hope, there we go. I don't know, for some reason, are you guys seeing the movie? No, Lisa. Maybe so strange. We see the, the, the indicator you know, <laughs> of the position in the movie is moving, but the movie itself is not playing. It's so strange. Um, just for fun, I'm going to escape because it was playing. Let's just see. Can you see it now? It seems like Zoom stops the movie from playing. All right, well, we'll have to live without the movies. Um, I don't know why it's not playing, but <laughs> we'll, you'll, have to, you'll have to have me back to play the movies to, for you in person. Um, what's really nice about this movie is you can actually see what happens with these satellite systems coming into the Milky Way um, and how, how those assemble. We think now that we actually know that those two are the most massive uh, satellites that, that probably came into the Milky Way. So, um, Moving on, um, so this model um, 
It's an empirical model for the galaxy halo connection, which has a bunch of parameters. But the nice thing about that is it's very flexible and it really allows us to marginalize over all of the uncertainties uh, in the galaxy halo connection. So that includes uh, things like how do we parameterize the, the faint end slope? How do we parameterize the satellite sizes? It turns out in the dwarf satellite regime, the sizes are quite important because some, some of these ultrafaints, if they're too large, won't be detected. Um, an important uh, thing is to look at the baryon effects. Some of the satellites actually do, we think, get disrupted by the Milky Way disk. Um, and so with this, we then go ahead and observe these uh, mock galaxies. We put, the, we put a simulated LMC in the right place on the sky. And that's important because if you look here, so this is the dark matter simulation now, you can see there is a very clear overdensity of objects that are around the LMC, satellites that came in uh, with the LMC when it was accreted uh, onto the Milky Way. And um, one, of the, one of the really interesting things that we've learned about the LMC recently is that it does, it does seem to have been accreted quite recently within the last 2 billion years or so. So we then apply the selection function of the surveys um, and then actually have a detection probability for every uh, object with both surveys and so that we actually have uh, can make a, a rigorous statistical comparison to observations. So what do we find? Um, first of all, we find that we actually, this model can match the data. But an interesting thing is that if we use a simulation that does not have a galaxy like the LMC that it that is roughly at the right position and distance and fell in relatively recently within two giga years or so, we cannot match the data. And that's because the anisotropy between the DES side and the uh, PANSTAR side is too large to explain without having satellite galaxies that came in with the LMC. So that's really interesting because having satellites of satellites, as I said in the beginning, is one of the key predictions you have from CDM. So the fact that we're actually seeing further evidence of that is, is really interesting. And uh, we predict in this model that uh, five of the DES satellites and one of the PANSTAR satellites should be associated with the LMC. Um, if you go back to that footprint, you might have noticed that the DES footprint is really close to the LMC, whereas PANSTAR is, is away from it. And that number six is, is in basically perfect agreement with recent Gaia results that identified how many of the satellites were associated with the LMC based on proper motions. Um, another, another thing we find is that the faintest satellite systems are in halos below a few times 10 to the eight solar masses. So that's really, really interesting. Basically, we can't match the data unless we populate those halos uh, as far down as a few times 10 to the 8. So that's telling us that there's no evidence yet for a galaxy formation cutoff for some missing things below that mass, either due to galaxy formation physics like reionization or to uh, dark matter physics. Um, and uh, this, this plot on the right now shows how the stellar mass of these galaxies is connected to the dark matter halo mass. Um, and you can see, you know, these 10, some of these faint, the faintest objects that we are actually already observing, which are, you know, just a few hundred solar masses in terms of their observed stars, appear to be living in, in these models that, that are constrained with the data in, in halos that are about 10 to the 8. Um, and, you know, there could be halos in lower mass systems. Uh, there probably are some. In these lower mass systems, this, this line of about 100 stars is the lowest that we can detect. Um, so with this estimate, we would estimate a little more than 100 systems um, in the Milky Way. Uh, and we haven't found all of them, partially because we haven't looked over the whole sky and partially because the data we're looking at is not deep enough to go out to the virial radius of, uh, of the galaxy. So we do expect a bunch of new discoveries in the next five years or so um, with existing data and, and certainly with the early data from the Vera Rubin Observatory, uh, which is going to survey half the sky and will be very, very exciting. Um, and, uh, you know, these, these, uh, these new systems that we see really should provide better constraints on the faint end slope, uh, which should really help us understand a little bit more 
uh, about um, about uh, galaxy formation models. So here's an example of, of a hydro simulation where the faint end slope uh, changes depending on whether you whether or not you have H2 star formation. Um, I just want to very briefly mention, I'm going a little slower than I need to, so I want to just very briefly mention a few directions that we're going in in the future. One is uh, trying to identify more satellites. So we are doing an interesting satellite search in Gaia data. This was just published by my uh, student, uh, Elise Dara Ford, uh, and two other graduate students at Stanford. Um, for the first time, using uh, the Gaia data for a full sky search to actually do this in phase space. So using the Gaia proper motion data along with the positions. Um, we also want to have improved simulation. So the, the direction we're going here is, is because, uh, as you saw, the LMC really matters a lot. So we want to have some better statistics of halos that actually do look just like the Milky Way itself, that, for example, have a recently merged LMC at the right distance and a Gaia Enceladus merger at the right distance. And this is a wonderful work being done with, with Ethan Nadler and, and uh, an undergraduate, Deveshi Bush. Um, uh, she's run about 15 simulations that really do look uh, like the Milky Way in this way, and, and they have slightly different accretion history, so that will be important for understanding the context of the Milky Way. And then another direction is uh, looking at improved modeling, tracking star formation histories. Um, we, we're, we've extended a model uh, called Universe Machine that I developed with Peter Beruzzi, uh, mostly for all of the other galaxies that aren't these very faint galaxies, we've now extended that to this regime uh, to try to yield, uh, have detailed predictions for the dwarf galaxy star formation histories. So it's really interesting that, uh, that our first results basically get a galaxy halo connection that's really consistent to what we get out of observations. Um, but there's a lot more work to do here because this model is, is still really missing some physics and is unconstrained at low mass. So there's going to be some really interesting stuff to do here when we actually track star formation histories. Okay, so I want to move on now to ask what does this tell us about dark matter? If we go back to this picture about warm dark matter or, uh, or cold dark matter, you can see by eye that, you know, uh, this is a more extreme warm dark matter than is currently uh, uh, plausible, but you can see that there's a lot less structure in this model than there is in the one on the right. And, um, you know, in, in terms of the power spectrum, there are some, uh, depending on the temperature of the warm dark matter particle, this uh, cutoff will happen at different scales. And that cutoff in the power spectrum has a, a similar cutoff in the mass uh, function of dark matter halos and including then dark matter subhalos. So this free streaming due to the uh, early velocity dispersion leads to a cutoff in the abundance of low mass halos. But it's not only dark, uh, warm dark matter that can do that. Um, if you have interactions between dark matter particles and standard model particles, you will also uh, have a suppression in the power spectrum uh, and in the subhalo mass function. Um, and where that is will depend on the strength of those interactions. Um, if you have a particle uh, like the axion that has some sort of uh, interference due to uh, a microscopic de Broglie wavelength, then you also will get um, the, this sort of interference that leads, this is sometimes called fuzzy dark matter, that also leads to a cutoff in the abundance of low mass halos. So all of these things can be constrained, and, and that's what we uh, try to do now with these same data. So the key here is to really jointly constrain the dark matter, the possible suppression of the dark matter um, uh, mass function with the galaxy halo connection. And, uh, and although there have been studies done uh, like this before, none of them have used this full sky distribution of satellites. None of them have used this detailed galaxy formation model that accounts for things like the disruption due to baryons, um, and, uh, and, and put this through the observational selection function. So I'm quite, quite excited about this and, and the prospects for this in the future. So you can see that we, we in this model, we constrain galaxy formation parameters like the faint end slope um, of the global luminosity function, the scatter between galaxies and halos, uh, whether galaxies are disrupted by their disk or not, and what we find that uh, it's fully consistent to what we're seeing in hydro simulations. 
And then we, we jointly constrain uh, the possible cutoff in the dark matter power spectrum. The bottom line is we don't see any clear evidence for that suppression. And we have a, a essentially an upper limit that the mass scale of the suppression of the halo mass function can't really uh, be uh, larger than 10 to a few times 10 to the seven M sun. So if we take that into um, directly into looking at how does this connect to these different models, these different models, warm dark matter, interacting dark matter, fuzzy dark matter, they have an impact on the transfer function of dark matter. And that has a consequent impact on the subhalo mass function. And the thing I want you to notice here is that the models that we are constraining, the, the ones that are um, essentially the maximum suppression that the data currently allows, are only different from CDM by about 25%. Um, at a scale of a few times 10 to the eight. So the current satellite observations are really sensitive to a 25% suppre suppression in subhalo abundance relative to CDM. So if it were suppressed by 50%, it would, we would already be able to rule that out um, with the satellite luminosity function. Um, so the, this Milky Way analysis really gives the strongest astrophysical constraints on a wide range of models. Um, these are the three that we looked at in this paper. And for warm dark matter, the, the constraint is that the mass of the warm dark matter particle has to be larger than 6.5 keV at 95% confidence. So that's uh, comparable to, but a little bit stronger than the limits from other kinds of probes of small scale structure like the Lyman Alpha Forest uh, and strong lensing. Um, Due to time, I'm going to go through the next things quite quickly, but please feel free to ask me uh, details about how it's constraining these models, because um, I want to get a, a little bit to the things outside the Milky Way. Um, but just to kind of go through these models quite quickly, a basic idea with warm dark matter is that the, the free streaming length has to be smaller than the halos that host those ultrafaints. And uh, that's actually ruling out the 3.5 kV X-ray line, ray line as a possible uh, sterile neutrino dark matter candidate. Um, for interacting dark matter, the dwarf satellites are now really the strongest constraint, much stronger. You can see here more than an order, multiple orders of magnitude, uh, stronger than previous constraints from the cosmic microwave background. Um, and the basic idea there is that the is that collisions in these models, in these interacting models, uh, due to dark matter baryon scattering, suppress the power um, at early times. And so the fact that that power, again, is not suppressed, rules out strong interactions. Um, and we can do that both for velocity independent and velocity dependent models. Um, and then fuzzy dark matter, like ultralight axions, um, those essentially that's saying that the, the wavelength, the de Broglie wavelength of those models also has to be smaller than the sizes of the smallest ultrafaints. And that can be interpreted as a lower limit um, on these models. Uh, you can see here, it's a dark matter masses of, of uh, below 10 to the minus 21 EV are now ruled out by these measurements. Um, and I think there's a lot of potential actually to uh, constrain self-interacting dark matter models. It seems that uh, we're sensitive to uh, cross sections of, of 0.1 centimeters squared per gram. And this is a work that, that we're doing right now, which I'm quite, it's quite exciting to actually, I think we're actually gonna be able to distinguish with different observables between SIDM and warm dark matter um, in their impacts. Um, one thing that happens is that satellites of satellites behave differently in warm dark matter than they do in self-interacting dark matter. So that is a potential way to discriminate between them. And then um, many of you I'm sure have followed this interesting tension uh, in the Hubble constant, which I'm not talking about dark energy or the Hubble constant today, but one of the possible solutions of that is to have some sort of decaying dark matter uh, model, which has a long lifetime. Um, and uh, it seems that Milky Way satellites can already start to constrain some of those models, uh, not yet all. 
but this is quite interesting. This is a paper we're, we're finishing up now. Um, and I think, you know, potentially that they'll have uh, the possibility of constraining most of that parameter space in the future. Um, so of course, Milky Way satellites aren't the only way to detect small halos. Uh, this is an, an a example of a beautiful image from ALMA where uh, we detected with Yasha Hezeva uh, a substructure uh, that was about 10 to the nine solar masses. Um, and recent analyses of lenses of the Lyman Alpha Forest and of stellar streams have uh, achieved roughly similar um, constraints uh, to the Milky Way satellites, although uh, with very different systematics. And I think that's quite important um, as we go on with these things to try to think about how do we combine these. Um, so we have one um, example of this, of how do we combine um, strong lenses. So the, the basic idea is that strong lensing flux ratios are very sensitive to substructure both within the dark matter halo that they're uh, that in the system they're in and along the line of sight. And um, the, these recent constraints uh, in a recent paper uh, working with uh, the strong lensing folks, uh, Simon Beer and Daniel Gilman, we combined uh, the satellites and the strong lensing results. And the thing that's interesting is that actually starts to break degeneracies between the dark matter model um, and the galaxy halo connection so that you can actually get stronger constraints overall. And, and the latest constraint uh, that we got is about is, is 9.7 keV for the for the warm dark matter model, which I think is the strongest strongest uh, results so far. But I think the most important thing besides just a race of the strongest constraint is to just think very, very carefully about the systematics and, and how do we break those degeneracies. So I think this is a really exciting area as things go forward because the number of lenses, which is now about, you know, in the around 10 is going to explode to be the, in the hundreds um, in the near future. So in my last uh, few minutes, I would want to talk a little bit about how do we put the Milky Way into context. So there are many things we can only measure in the Milky Way. Some of these dimmest satellites that I talked about resolve star formation histories, uh, the local dark matter distribution. And we really want to know how robust are conclusions based on one system. So it's really important in all of these things to put the Milky Way into context with similar systems. And in order to do that, um, many years ago now, uh, Marla Gia and I started this uh, really fun project called the Saga Survey. Saga stands for Satellites Around Galactic Analogs. And um, turns out this was a really hard project, so it's taken us a long time. Our goal was to, to identify um, 100 Milky Way light galaxies. And by Milky Way like in this case, I really just mean L star ish galaxies in the relatively uh, nearby universe, 20 to 40 megaparsecs away, and try to measure, try to identify their satellite galaxies and measure distances to those uh, satellite galaxies. And uh, we had our first result out uh, in 2017 and a new paper that, that just came out uh, this year um, with 36 of these systems. Um, so that's about a third of our plan. Um, and we actually are, I think about two thirds of the way done with the data taking now. So uh, there'll be lots more results to come. So this is really exciting because we have now not just one Milky Way, but, uh, but many tens of Milky Ways. And to put this into context uh, of, of other things, um, you know, in the local group, in the Milky Way, we can measure about 60 satellites. In M31, we can measure about 25. Uh, there's some new results um, by Carlston et al that uses a tip of the red giant branch and surface brightness fluctuations to get uh, systems like the Milky Way in the local volume. And there you can get about five satellites per host. Um, with the Saga survey, we're really, we, re we, we wanted to go a little bit further out so that we could really get statistics. Um, and so the, st the, we're typically getting systems that have on average three satellites per host. So going down to stellar masses of 10 to the six to 10 to the nine. Um, and then, you know, if you if you use uh, the Sloan main sample, you can get out to about 200 megaparsecs, um, and then you typically have one satellite per host. Um, in the very near future, we're actually going to be able to do 
much better at 200 megaparsecs uh, with the DESI survey. So the, the DESI survey, which is uh, just starting now, we're, we're in survey validation now, um, should have, there's a part of it, it's mostly focused on baryonic acoustic oscillations, but there's a part of it that will get a bright galaxy sample uh, to R of 19.5 and, and, and a bit to 19 of 20. So that will increase the, the number that we'll be able to get in a nearby universe. So um, basic idea of Saga in, in stage one, we wanted to really make sure that we were getting everything. And the systems that we're looking at, um, which are you know three to four per square degree, um, if you, we're going down to R of 20.75 and, and in, or in the virial radius of, of a Milky Way-like object, um, there's you know, a few thousand objects to that uh, magnitude. And so in the first round, we just wanted to really make sure we were finding everything. So we kind of brute forced it and got redshifts uh, with very conservative color cuts uh, to get about a thousand per square degree. And we identified eight systems that way. We were then able to make better cuts um, and uh, get that down so that we can observe these things with about 200 square degrees. That's great because it means that we can just do one or two pointings um, with the telescopes we're using, which is AAT, MMT, and Palomar. Um, and so we now have uh, you know, uh, 36 systems in, in our recent work. And um, this is what they all look like. Here's the, the, uh, all of these systems and their satellites. So we identified about uh, 127 satellites around 36 hosts. These are what you see in my background here as well. Um, and one of the things that you can see in this plot is that the number of object of satellites in these systems, they're, they're color coded by the host. So two of them actually had no satellites to this limit. Oops. And uh, one of them had, had nine. So it's a wide range and the Milky Way sits kind of comfortably in the middle of that range. Um, we find some uh, modest correlation with host galaxy luminosity. So here you see the number of satellites as a function of the host galaxy luminosity uh, and on the right hand side as a function of the brightest satellite. So if the thing has something you know, that's even brighter than the LMC, it's more likely to have uh, more satellites than if it doesn't have something bright like that. And that both of these things are consistent with uh, the theoretical predictions that we made for this a few years ago. Um, and so we now have these 36 luminosity functions. Um, as I mentioned, uh, the, the hosts have between zero and nine uh, satellites and, and the Milky Way luminosity function actually is consistent with being drawn from this broader set of luminosity functions. Um, and about 30% of the systems host uh, at least one LMC mass satellite here. Um, we can then do a more detailed comparison with the theoretical models, and, and this is still in progress, but this is using some of the galaxy halo connection models that are very similar to what I told you about in for the Milky Way, right? We count, this is the distribution of the number of satellites per system. Uh, it, the black points are in the data and the blue points are in, the, in those simulations plus a model for the galaxy halo connection. And you can see those are in pretty good agreement. We'll be able to do this lots more detailed statistical tests once we have 100, which, which will be soon. And then one of the most interesting things that we're finding uh, from Saga is that in the Milky Way, if you, if you know anything about the Milky Way satellites, um, the, the two brightest systems, the LMC and SMC, are, are actively star forming, but most of the other objects are not actively star forming there. They are quenched. And so you can see that when you add up the Milky Way and M31 and you plot the fraction of the galaxies that are not forming stars as a function of their stellar mass, that's what you, where you see this orange band. And Saga is down here in the green. So overall, Saga systems are more quenched than we see in the local group. Now, we are, uh, our, our, our sample is selected on magnitude, not stellar mass. So, so certainly we are more likely um, to see, uh, you know, star forming things. But, uh, but we, um, you know, what, what's really clear here is that, uh, is that there are star forming systems um, in 
the Milky Way and, uh, uh, sorry, in, in the Saga systems, more star forming satellites than there are in the Milky Way and M31. And that's really, really important, I think, um, as you think about trying to uh, use these satellite systems to constrain models. And this is just an example um, of some hydro simulations uh, where, uh, you know, there's a large scatter expected and, and uh, people are getting different results. So it's quite, quite interesting. And I think uh, as our sample increases, we'll be able to do much more detailed comparisons and tests. Um, so I'll try to finish up uh, very shortly, just uh, emphasizing where we are with this survey. Uh, the paper that, that came out earlier this year, led by Yao Yuan Mao, um, had 36 uh, hosts and uh, 127 satellites. We, we took 25,000 redshifts to, uh, to do this. Um, but we now are quite efficient, so we can get to 100 uh, pretty quickly, and we, we expect to publish papers on, on that full set uh, sometime next year. In my last minute, I want to say uh, something that I'm doing with DESI. Mansi asked me about this. So, so DESI is a new spectrograph that is um, on the Mayall telescope in Arizona. Um, and Mostly what DESI is going to do is a survey of 35 million uh, galaxies and quasars to measure baryon acoustic oscillations to study the growth of structure and expansion history of the universe to learn about the properties of dark energy. But there are a few extra targets and uh, there was a competitive uh, internal proposal process to uh, ask what should be done with the spare targets and, and I'm really, really excited. We just found out uh, recently few weeks ago that we have a, an approved secondary target program. And what is the idea that we're trying to do? Well, what Saga does is it really gives us a great data set for figuring out how do we efficiently select low redshift galaxies based on their photometric properties. So before this, before Saga, the reason Saga was so hard is because there were so few galaxies um, in this magnitude and redshift regime that there was just no way to train. And now we have such galaxies um, and we think we can quite efficiently select these. So we're, we're hoping to, you know, if this goes forward for the full DESI survey, it's still very exploratory, but if this goes forward, we would expect to get something like half a million um, galaxies at redshift less than 0.03 um, over a third of the sky, which would enable a bunch of really exciting studies. And, and that's combined with the bright galaxy survey that I mentioned earlier that will that will target 10 million galaxies um, with our uh, brighter than 20. OK, so I will end there. I know I talked about a lot of things and I'll just summarize a, a few key points here. Um, We've now really done a pretty systematic study of the existing galaxy population within the Milky Way. And we don't see any cutoff in the abundance of those observable ultrafaints. And so that's indicating that there is nothing in the dark matter physics that is doing something to suppress the mass function um, above about 10 to the eight. And so that gives really strong constraints on both the galaxy halo connection and on a bunch of different dark matter properties. Um, and then with the Saga survey, we can really uh, get this whole other set of systems that helps put the Milky Way into cosmological context. And, and so far, what we're finding is the Milky Way has basically a typical number, maybe slightly more than average uh, in terms of the number of satellites, but more of them. Um, sorry, I should, this, this is uh, incorrect. It should say more are star forming. Um, Okay, so looking forward, one of the things we're working on very hard this spring is actually combining these galaxy halo connection uh, robustly from the Saga data and the Milky Way data, and, and that really helps reduce degeneracies in this sort of intermediate mass regime. I think there's a lot more that can be done in terms of combining constraints from the Milky Way with constraints from strong lensing and other probes of small scale structure, so I'm quite, quite excited about that. Um, and I, I'm also uh, really having a lot of fun uh, right now thinking about how we use this Saga data to inform this new survey uh, that we're kind of doing uh, by the skin of our teeth with the DESI spare fibers. Um, but I think that's really just a pilot for what could be done with a dedicated survey uh, like that in the future to really map out dwarf galaxies in the local universe. So thank you so much. 
Thank you, Risa. Um, are there questions as Monsi sent in the chat? Uh, raise your hand with the reactions if you have questions. Uh, Sunil, I see you. Hi, Risa. Great. Hi. Great to, oh, there's an echo. Um, let me kill the echo. Oh, we lost you, Sunil, I think. Happy day. While we're waiting for Sunil, maybe some students want to ask questions. Can you hear me now? Mm -hmm. Okay, sorry about that. Um, so how far up do you think you can push the lower limit on the dark matter particle mass uh, using these kinds of techniques? Is it sort of another factor of two or is it possible to get up to say 100 keV? Yeah, I don't think we'll get to 100 keV, but, um, but it's, still, it's still unclear. You know, you might have thought that you need to get lower mass objects in order to push it a lot. And that's actually not the case. So just building up the statistics of objects that are the same mass as the lowest ones that we know of now, that should help move this forward. So I think we have at least a factor of two. Um, it's probably more than that when we have the full population. Um, and then I think the other thing is that uh, when we combine this with other small scale probes, it, I think we have a lot more power. So I think, you know, I, I do expect to, to get to that level in, in the next decade with a combination of probes for sure. Nancy? Yeah. Thank you, Risa, for that wonderful talk. Um, I was actually very excited about the saga results and what you're going to do with DESI. Um, in the same vein, uh, with the Paloma Transient Factory, we actually did this um, narrowband H alpha survey from yeah. reach of zero to 0 0.05 in using narrowbands. Uh, maybe some of that could be useful to you. So um, my former postdoc, Dave Cook, actually published a catalog of these um, H alpha emitters in the local universe. and. I mean, that could be useful for the Saga and uh, DESI target selection. I think so too. I mean, you and I talked about this, I think maybe something like four years ago or something when we were really <laughs> still in a very exploratory days with this. And I think it, it is really, I think we now have enough data that it would be very interesting to come back to you and see where it overlaps, where it doesn't overlap, where they could both help each other. Because I, yeah. I am also really excited about just like the general possibility of like surveying a local universe for such a wide range of, of science goals, including the transient universe. So, so I think this combination could be quite interesting. Yeah. Right. So our catalog is done. We can just send it to you. Okay, fantastic. <laughs> Great. I really look forward to looking, digging into that then. Other questions? Do any of the students have questions? Mia, go ahead. Hi, Risa, great talk. Um, I had a couple of questions. So first, sort of from the observational end, um, can you explain how you measured the quenching fraction of the Saga satellites? Yeah, so I mean, wh what we have is, um, let's see if I, oh, let's see if I can. Get back to that. Yeah, so um, what we have in the data uh, is uh, spectra from MMT or AAT, occasionally deeper spectra from Palomar. Um, and so we're just looking for the existence of, of emission lines um, it, right now. Um, and so basically what you're seeing here is just the fraction of galaxies in this stellar mass bin that don't have any signs of star formation. Um, from the emission lines. I see. Okay. So from like yeah. H alpha. Okay. Yeah. And then my second question, I'm very much an observer. And so at this point, I don't really know what an axion is and I'm too afraid to ask. So could you okay. just explain sort of astrophysically 
<laughs> what the signatures of an axion of axion dark matter would be? Yeah, awesome. So I didn't really have time to uh, go into the details of of the dark matter models, but let me just let me just spend one minute here. Um, the basic idea here is that what axions are particles that look a lot like the WIMP. Um, like a lot like a standard cold dark matter particle um, for most of structure formation, except, and, and, and axions are, you know, from a particle physics point of view, let me just say that, it, you know, they're, they're roughly as natural as a WIMP in the sense that they were predicted for another reason. They were predicted to solve the strong uh, CP problem. And so, you know, there's a reason to think they might be there. The big difference from the WIMP is that for WIMPs, we're looking at particles that are, you know, often 100, 10 to 100 GeV. And here you can see we're looking at particles that are very, very, very low mass, 10 to the minus 22 EV. These are what's called ultralight axions. The typical uh, axion actually out of QCD, you can see on this plot, is, is, is actually much more massive. So the original axions that were predicted are over here, whereas the ones that we're currently ruling out are the really, really low mass ones. And the reason we are ruling out the, the low mass ones is that the main thing for you to think about is that for these very low mass ones, instead of acting like a particle in this regime, they basically act like a wave. And so the reason they're called fuzzy is because they, if they, they actually have a wavelength, and if the wavelength were very big, so if the particle is very low mass, then the wavelength would be very big. And if the wavelength is, is actually the size of dwarf galaxies, then it would it, it could disrupt the structure in those galaxies. So that's the that's the main thing you can take away. Gotcha. Thanks. Yeah. I think Richard has his hands up next and then Tony. Uh, yeah. Hi, Professor Weschler. Great talk. I really, really enjoyed it. Um, I was curious um, on these small scales if uh, neutrino physics plays a role and if there are any degeneracies that need to be accounted for. And I guess in this intermediate mass range of the halo function, is is it like a subdominant effect um, or? Yeah, so um, the current limits that we, you know, the current strongest limits that we have on the mass of the neutrino or the, co or the contribution of the neutrino to the, the dark matter, um, mostly uh, those, those strongest limits tend to come from uh, either the Lyman Alpha Forest or from uh, regular galaxy clustering. Um, and those limits right now, I believe, are already stronger in the sense that, that those don't have enough um, hot dark matter that they would be impacting the scales that we're talking about here. Great, But, there, but it, it definitely is, an, it, I think this is going to be a really important point as we go forward and as those limits get tighter from both directions. Yeah. Great, thanks. Hi, Tony. Hi, Risa. How are you? Good to see you again, even Good. though even though it's virtual. Um, I've been in Phil's Galaxy class this this quarter, and we've talked a lot about feedback. Um, mm -hmm. You mentioned at one point uh, feedback, maybe from disks influencing these satellite galaxies. Yeah. Based on the results you've got so far, like have there been advances in in the understanding of this sort of like quote feedback from disks? Yeah. So I want to say two things about that. Um, so in so the first thing is that in our model, we, you know, in the galaxy halo model that goes into this, one of the parameters, which is this thing called beta, it basically, you can see that what beta is doing in this plot is suppressing the substructure. And that is largely due to the disk. So this, what we did here was we, we, we used the fire simulations to actually tune a dark matter only model for disruption. So in our model, we have parameters that specify, depending on the orbit of the subhalos, are they likely to get disrupted by the disk? And we basically parameterize that and tune it to all of the hydro simulations that we have available. 
and we then actually are able to constrain that parameter. So, so you know, if we 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 tune the model so that it's much more flexible than than the current hydro simulations allow. And so then, what you can see, if I can get back to the constraints, is that um, we actually do have a constraint on that parameter. So b equals one is disruption, just like the fire simulations. B equals zero would be no disruption at all, just all of the dark matter structures uh, being there and not being disrupted by either the disk or the internal feedback, because there's two ways to disrupt the satellites. One is you know, stellar feedback or supernova feedback within a galaxy. And then the other is what happens to the subhalo as it interacts with the disk. And we think the latter is probably a little bit more dominant in this regime. But it seems that the no feedback version is ruled out by the data, meaning that that no feedback version would produce so many satellites that uh, you just, we don't see that many. Um, and it has a slightly different behavior than the other, like than the dark matter versions that change it. And so we actually, interestingly, are able to distinguish between those two, even though, you know, there is some degeneracy. So that's where we are now. It's basically consistent with the hydro, but this will get better and, and it will be really interesting. Thanks. Awesome. Thanks so much. Thank you. I think uh, Yunting, you have your hand up. Hi. Um, so I would like to follow up on the previous question on this galaxy disruption. Mm -hmm. So, um, uh, we've been very interested in the something called the intrahalo light. So it's like the the stars that is originally in the satellite galaxies and being disrupted by some um, tidal streaming or some uh, 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 effect in the uh, during the merger process. So I'm wondering, like, if you can constrain this galaxy disruption, are you able to make a prediction on um, like how much uh, this intrahalo light? Uh, uh, we, we could expect in, in a dark matter halo. Yeah, that's super, super interesting. And I, 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 it's something that I'm actually excited to think about again for the future. So I worked on um, the intra-halo light in, in these kinds of models uh, quite some years ago, maybe, um, I don't know, uh, more than 10 years ago. Um, but the models have matured quite a bit since then. And in the current context, what I'm really excited about in terms of doing that is this approach here. So this paper that we just put out on the archive, um, which uses universe machine. So instead of just abundance matching, which is basically just taking a galaxy and pasting it on a halo, we now trace the full star formation histories. Um, and, and the technical advance that we did in this paper was figure out how to run universe machine on zoom ins simultaneously with the, with the cosmological boxes. And that's important from a methodological point of view because it means that we actually will be able to run it on high enough resolution simulations that we should start to be able to actually model the intracluster light or the intrahalo light. And so um, we haven't done that yet, but it is definitely something that I'm, that I'm very excited about. And I, I think it's really interesting. One more thing that I'll say about that is, um, we, you know, one of the really interesting things um, is that I think for the intrahalo light itself, the stellar halo, the Milky Way is not necessarily going to be typical because we know that the Milky Way had, you know, two, two uh, relatively big events that probably dominate um, its, uh, its stellar halo. In fact, we did a, a, a theoretical study a few years back that showed that's actually that's what happens normally is that it's sort of two or three satellite systems that are responsible for most of the intrahalo light in a given system. So that's really interesting because it means that the details of when those satellites came in actually have a, an important impact on the, on the intrahalo light itself. Thanks. <laughs> 